Well, thank you guys all for joining today. Uh, my name is Vanessa Scott, and I'm the Director of Corporate Relations and Innovation here at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Um, and I will be your moderator today. Um, Douglas Alden, who is the chair of the Scripps Technical Forum, uh, usually hosts and moderates these, but he is working in the field today. So I am standing in. I wanted to let you know that this session will be recorded and will be added to our uh, Scripps Technical Forum YouTube channel under the Scripps Oceanography YouTube channel afterwards. So if anybody misses this, or if you have colleagues that you think might be interested in, in uh, listening on afterwards, um, you can find that on the Scripps Technical Forum website, which I'll drop in the chat. Uh, uh, as far as Q&A, we will have the presenter kind of speak and then we'll hold the questions uh, until the end, which I will moderate. So please feel free to enter them throughout the presentation, either in the chat or in through the Q&A button at the bottom center of your screen. Uh, we definitely encourage an interactive discussion. Um, so please, even if you wanna um, unmute yourself at the end and ask a question, um, feel free to do so. Um, also, we will uh, we welcome your feedback and suggestions on upcoming speakers and topics. So please feel free to reach out to either myself or Douglas, our contact information is right there uh, with any ideas and interest uh, for future talks. Um, and with that, I will go ahead and introduce our speaker today. We have Dan Shropshire with Teledyne Marine, who's going to be talking to us about some of their new technologies uh, and uh, oceanographic research applications for these vehicles. So uh, I will hand it over to you, Dan. Excellent. All right, guys. Sounds good. Let me, let's see, pull up my presentation here. All right. All right, how's that? You guys see that okay? Looks awesome. great. Okay, awesome. All right, um, well, thanks very much for having us uh, present today. Um, we're actually really excited to be uh, at, the, at the seminar here and give a chance to sort of show our latest and greatest technologies and more focused on the scientific community and how maybe we have some applications that um, feel like would be useful for, for scripts. Um, and so we'll be going through that. Um, and uh, you know, as, as Vanessa said, we'll hold comments to the end or, or questions to the end, but um, certainly keep track of those and I'll try to address as many as I can. I did look at some brief questions to see what people had in mind and I think we'll hit most of those. I've got um, quite a bit of content, so I'm gonna go fairly quickly, but um, hopefully uh, hit, hit all sort of avenues that people might be interested in today. Uh, so a little bit about myself. Um, I started at Teledyne about nine years ago now I'm currently the VP of Sales and Marketing, but um, really my background is much more technical. I'm an engineer by training, um, came up sort of through the aerospace business for a number of years and then transferred over into the, the marine vehicle space, uh, really working on program management and product development. So that's sort of my, my main background is in uh, product development, um, strategy and design. Uh, so um, they, I sort of got moved into the marketing and sales job, but um, but fits well, and we still have a lot of people in our group that work on product development um, and, and, and sort of uh, uh, vehicle development. So with that, um, feel free to ask any questions. I, I it, like I said, we're going to touch on some science topics, not in a lot of depth, so I won't be able to cover all those in a lot of detail, but um, if there's anything of particular interest you see and you say, oh, wow, that's really great. Um, I'd like to learn more about that science piece. Let me know in the chat or, or again in a question and um, we'll get somebody who can speak to that in more detail. Uh, and happy, happy April Fool's Day to everybody. Um, I'm not gonna play any jokes. Um, okay, so getting started, just a quick overview of Teledyne Technologies. Uh, getting most people probably fairly familiar with Teledyne, but um, you may be a little less familiar with some of our other parts of the business. Um, so Teledyne now is somewhere around a $5 billion um, company in terms of annual revenue. We have a market cap of around maybe $20 billion, so it's become a very big business uh, with the integration of FLIR, uh, the uh, infrared and digital imaging group that we acquired last year really grew Teledyne quite a bit. Um, so we have four main areas that we focus on, instrumentation being one of which we're gonna talk today about specifically in the marine instrumentation, digital imaging, which grew again substantially when we, we bought FLIR, uh, aerospace and defense, and then engineered systems. Uh, so we kind of cover, cover the gamut. Uh, within instrumentation, we've got three segments. There's the marine instrumentation, the environmental instrumentation, and then we have a, a test and measurement group, uh, the built oscilloscopes and other sort of devices there. 
The environment, environmental group is really looking at pollution monitoring in particular, which includes air and water. Um, so they do that. And again, we'll be focused on marine today. Uh, so within the marine uh, technology group here or instrumentation group, we have five main segments. We um, have seismic, which we have uh, both seismic sources for generating sound in the ocean. And then we have um, hydrophone arrays or geophones for measuring the return, uh, mostly for oil and gas. Uh, we have a large segment here in Interconnect. In fact, that's the biggest part of the marine group is selling cables and connectors, again, mostly to oil and gas. Um, we specialize in high power um, and um, high throughput um, subsea connect connections. So, um, you know, in water connectors that are mostly used by large ROVs, uh, used very deep. Uh, we have our imaging group that creates sonars and cameras and lights. Uh, we'll be talking a lot about some of those projects, products today. And then um, our instrumentation group, which you, you, I would say scripts are most familiar with, uh, with RDI and Benthos being our two main brands there that deal with the uh, current profilers, uh, the Doppler velocity loggers, and then the modems and releases. And then today we're really going to focus on vehicles, but I am going to talk a little bit about Benthos as well, uh, since that actually is also in our group out here um, in Massachusetts, which is where I'm from. So specifically, again, in the vehicle side, I'm going to talk about our main, main vehicle line here. So we have AUVs, we have towed systems, uh, we have our gliders, again, you're probably well familiar with. We have an ROV line I'm not going to touch a whole lot on today, and then our boats. Uh, but we are going to talk um, also about some floats and, uh, and some other, like I said, benthos as well, which um, falls into our instrument group over here. Um, so we, we cover all the way from, you know, space to subsea. We have similar challenges, which is, um, you know, sort of why these technology groups are all combined at Teledyne. But uh, we've got uh, CCD cameras on the Mars rover. Uh, you know, we've got a lot on a lot of the space telescopes that are out there now. Uh, James Webb has a bunch of our CCDs on it. Um, and then all the way down to the deep ocean where we are at 6,000 meters. Uh, so you've got, again, similar environments, similar problems to deal with. So um, it makes sense that we have all those technologies and we can share that across the different groups. Um, something you may not know about Teledyne uh, outside of our product group is we actually have a couple of other interesting areas in the business where uh, we do scientific research, specific, specifically we do a lot of material science and develop materials that are very useful for, again, deep sea and deep space. Um, so if you ever have an interesting or a challenging material issue and you're looking for somebody who might be able to help, um, we do have a whole, uh, whole group of PhDs up in the uh, Los Angeles area that are, um, that's what they focus on. So it's the old Rockland Scientific Group. Uh, so material science is a big part of what they do, but they also do a lot of other really complex um, complex uh, uh, problems or solve complex problems there too uh, with control and, and a bunch of other um, design ideas. So, so that's another group we have. And then um, we have our product groups. And then we also have our system integrators uh, at Teledyne Brown who deal both with space systems and uh, with subsea systems like the SEAL delivery system here, uh, which is called SWIX. Um, if you look at how the Marine Group came together, uh, as I mentioned, we're a bunch of uh, separate companies, about 23 different brands uh, over the years that have been purchased by Teledyne to create our Marine Group. Again, many of these you'll have familiarity with, like RDI here, uh, Benthos we mentioned, um, uh, DGO's connector company, Web Research we'll talk about today out here with our gliders and uh, our floats. Um, Benthos, I mentioned, Gavi is the AUV company. You know, so you can see over the last 15 to 20 years is really where all those acquisitions have come in. We have Global Footprint. Uh, again, I'm in North Falmouth here in Massachusetts, uh, but we have a group of RDIs in San Diego with you guys. Our headquarters is up the road in Thousand Oaks, um, but we have both service centers and sales centers and manufacturing centers throughout both the US and um, in Denmark and in the United Kingdom. And our AUV company is up in Reykjavik in Iceland. Um, so kind of cover the globe from that extent and uh, have salespeople all over. Uh, again, for the Marine Vehicles team, which is what we're gonna really look at today, we've got two offices, the one here in, in Massachusetts that makes our floats, gliders, ROVs, ASVs, the surface vessels, um, benthos equipment, sound sources, and then our Iceland office again, which is our, our submarine, our AUV business. 
Uh, we cover subsea to surface from you know top all the way from bottom to top or top to bottom. Um, we have a couple of different boats that will I'll highlight again the ROVs. Uh, sort of at the thousand meter range, we've got gliders as well as AUVs, um, and then floats go below that. And then we have the new Sea Raptor, which I'll show you a couple of images on, which is our deep rated AUV system that we're now selling. Uh, that goes all the way down to 6,000 meters, as does our deep apex float. Um, and then we have a towed system that goes to that level as well. Uh, our main business focus is, is defense and security as well as academic and commercial. It's actually a fairly even split amongst these groups now. So uh, we're seeing more and more in the defense area, but we're still heavily involved in uh, academics, especially with gliders. Um, so as I mentioned, we'll look at these different brand names. So you got Gavia Web, uh, Ocean Sciences, our boat manufacturer, Seabotics vehicles, and then um, Benthos not only does acoustics, but these towed sleds as well. Um, all right, so to start off, we'll talk about AUVs. I've got a couple of just quick pictures of the vehicle, and then I'm going to talk about a couple of interesting scientific use cases that uh, people have done over the years. Um, so we have three different versions of AUVs. We'll start with the small here. This is the um, Gavia 1000 meter uh, man portable system. Um, and uh, one interesting thing it's sort of unique about the Gavia system is that it's modular. It's highly modular. You see a video here in just a second that it shows how um, it, easy it is to take apart and put together. So you can actually, I'm just going to mute the sound there, uh, but it's, you can actually buy the modules independently and then assemble the vehicle uh, to, to meet your mission demands. So if at first you just want to do um, sonar imaging and scanning, um, you know, you can set the vehicle up to do that. But then if you need to go back and do uh, a mission with a camera, um, you know, or uh, a different a different sonar. All you have to do is swap that module in, and then you know redo your mission, and it'll go off and and, and redo that. So um, every time you attach a module, it self identifies, so it knows what that module is, tells the software what's on board, and then um, you know can can basically uh, figure out what uh, what modules again it has in, installed. Um, so it makes it really easy to, to manipulate it into different packages and also makes it really portable. Uh, so again, if you're out on a boat or a rib or a ship, you know, you can ship it in shipping containers, uh, I'm sorry, um, carded cases or Pelican cases, and then assemble it once you get there. So it makes it really um, easy logistically to, to get it in and out of places. Um, so some of the, you know, use cases for these AUVs uh, specific to the Gavia here is uh, pipeline inspection or subsea mapping. Here we're doing a, a pipeline survey um, of, a, of a, a sewage pipe that was subsea, um, doing a, um, just a imaging of that and then putting it together uh, through our mosaicing software. Um, so that's a typical mission. More on the science side. Oh, and before we get that, I'll mention too that you know, we have the ability to do onboard processing, which is sort of a new thing. Uh, with Keras on board, um, and that allows uh, able to again reduce the amount of data that you have to offboard once you get your vehicle back, because um, it'll actually compile some of the data on board, and, and it can even you know look for specific things and tell you that there's events that have been triggered or um, you know specific items you might be looking for. So there are ways of um, increasing your efficiency by installing a software package like that. Um, but as I mentioned, getting to more scientific use cases, this is a, an under ice map, mapping mission that was done um, around 2004, actually. This was up in British Columbia in a lake, uh, but this group also did sub, um, mission sub ice in Antarctica. Here, a diver is taking the Gavia down to release it. It's got a CTD here on the front, um, but they cut the hole in the ice and they communicate with it and can get positioning out of the um, acoustic modem uh, which um, is a benthos modem in this case, um, so they can keep track of the vehicle. Uh, but as the vehicle got closer to um, the surface, it actually flips upside down so they can do side scan imaging um, and create these, uh, these three-dimensional maps. Um, so um, here it is, the uh, University of British Columbia was the partner on this, and uh, they took one of the gobbies. Here's You can see it's actually flying um, inverted. Um, and they did have it tethered just in case so they could bring it back, but um, was able to do this the mapping with the side scan scanner and the camera images uh, to provide a really interesting uh, mosaic here. Um, there's also another group uh, up at UC Davis. Um, Alex Forrest is the PI's name, and he's doing work in um, a sub ice as well in Antarctica and has several missions going right now. 
uh, with Gavia for that. Another, I think, interesting use case here is in archaeology, uh, subsea archaeology. Here is a, a survey we did up in Telemark, Norway. This is quite a while ago as well, but um, they were looking for uh, these old Viking wrecks, um, you know, from from obviously a long time ago, and doing side scan sonar work again to identify what they were. Um, so over 20 targets in the three days that they surveyed here, uh, uh, and that was a. Uh, an example, another example of that here is uh, looking for a um, shipwreck off the coast of Iceland at the time. This was an old oil tanker and they wanted to actually see if it was uh, an environmental issue. Um, here's an image from the surface vessel using multi-beam sonar and uh, you can't really see, there's obviously something there, but it, you can't really make out what it is. So um, we sent down the Gavia and got some really nice high res side scan images here. Um, of the vessel and were able to actually determine that um, this was the, the Shiver, or Sherman, um, you know, once we got down there and you could actually even make out here, you can see this, the, the, the smokestack as well as the porthole, you know, some very obvious marks here to tell you that that is the wreck that they found. Um, so, you know, with these, these um, Gavi AUVs, not just able to do sort of your classic mapping missions, uh, but can also do more sophisticated missions like this um, and do chemical analysis too. So uh, moving on to the Sea Raptor here, some really interesting, uh, you know, with a, with a larger payload capability and longer endurance, you can do some really interesting missions. Um, so this is a 3,000 or 6,000 meter rated vehicle. It's a syntactic foam, so it's fully flooded as opposed to the Gavia, um, which is an air pr or pressure housing. And um, here we can host a whole variety of different sensors. Um, we have 24 plus hour uh, duration. And we're actually working on getting that almost out to um, a whole week of battery duration in certain configurations. So you can do a tremendous amount of uh, subsea scanning and subsea work with these vehicles. Um, as far as sensors, you know, now again, you can host more powerful and, and larger sensors. So here we're looking at uh, this is a multi-beam echo sound is a Resonant T50, so getting two-dimensional, um, you know, high-res imagery with that. Um, certainly side scan sonars, um, cameras with um, really bright lights, so you can really get a good view, certainly at the bottom with those. Uh, we have a sub-bottom profiler that can penetrate the bottom and look for, um, you know, areas uh, down to even 50 meters below the surface, depending on the soil type. Uh, so you can look for buried cables or um, pipes or, again, maybe a strata or archaeology. Um, sound velocity, certainly meters for helping with the sonar measurements, um, obstacle avoidance sonars, et cetera. So lots of different payloads that you can put on here. And we've in recently integrated a synthetic aperture sonar from Kraken and, and gotten some really high resolution data. I'll show you a couple of quick pictures of that as well. Um, here we are. This was actually the first vehicle we built a few years ago, but this was a test that we ran off of the uh, Icelandic Coast Guard cutter here off the coast of Iceland. Um, and you get some idea of the scale of the vehicle. It's uh, you know about 20 feet long, so it's, it's sizable. As I mentioned, some, some synthetic aperture uh, images here. This is the image of an uh, old B-24 wing of a uh, World War II aircraft that had uh, gone down off the coast of Iceland. Um, we knew where it was. We went out and got some nice high resolution imagery from, again, the Kraken Minsas. Um, also knew there's another aircraft uh, off the coast there, Northrop um, N3PB. And um, again, get some really high, high res detail there. Um, this is a close up image with side scan data, but then this is the camera, the, um, the CathX camera with the strobe to get you know, actual imagery of it. Um, so you can see you can get a lot of really great data off of these platforms. Um, so again, it's a new system for us. Um, what we've sold two very recently to a, a company called Argeo, uh, the Argeo Group over in Norway. And the thing now we're finding is this is, you know, someone asked about what's sort of new in the industry or new technology is that there's, there's a huge push for data as a service or, or actually selling data as opposed to selling vehicle time or survey time or even, you know, vehicles themselves. Uh, there's a lot of companies now that are, that are building their business model around just selling data. So you can imagine as, um, you know, as a company or even a, a scientific investigator needing to get survey out of a certain area, um, if it's already been surveyed, that data may already exist and you can, you can go in and 
request the data and they'll just send it to you. Or if it hasn't been done, then um, you can buy that data and they're gonna go off and survey it and then provide that to you and then possibly make that data available for other people as well. So it's a, a whole different model now that we're starting to see, but we've sold a number of systems to um, companies now doing that. Um, so that's been a big change in the, uh, in the AV, AUV market. Um, the last AUV I'm gonna talk about quickly here is Osprey. This is our new 12 and three quarter inch diameter vehicle. So it's a bigger uh, AUV, um, sort of in between the, the Sea Raptor and our Gravia. Um, so uh, this again has somewhere around 24 hour endurance and, and can host higher, um, higher end side scans, sonars or synthetic aperture sonars, um, thousand or possibly 2000 meter, depending on the, the variety you get. Um, a little less endurance, uh, but again, it has the same modular concept. It's an air system again, uh, so we can host a lot of different pay payloads and platforms. And so as a scientist, you may be interested in a vehicle like this, where you want to even build your own platform or payload section and integrate it into ours. We give the uh, ICDs out so that you can do that. You can build your own you know, payload, attach it to this vehicle and uh, you know, do your own missions. A um, little bit about the slope and glider, probably what we're most known for now. Um, there have been about 900 gliders delivered to date, so quite a few. Um, some of those certainly for the U.S. Navy, but a lot of those in the academic world, in particular uh, Rutgers University, Dalhousie University, um, a lot of the Canadian universities fly slocums, as, as you guys probably know. Um, so we have a lot of experience, a lot of different sensor packages uh, over the years. Um, but a great platform for doing scientific, scientific measurements. <laughs> it is uh, easily portable. You can see, you know, small, small in size. Um, you know, with the glider cart, it's pretty easy to, to move around, um, easily deployable, easily retrieved. So it does make, um, again, a real nice science platform. Uh, very quiet. Um, you know, it, it, it doesn't really have, there is a motor or a propeller on the back for use getting through thermoclines, but for the most part, it um, ha makes no noise. So that makes it a really interesting um, platform for a variety of different sensors, uh, everything from the classic CTDs for getting temperature, depth, and, um, and pressure measurements, uh, or salinity measurements, and then um, also uh, you know, items that are um, looking at oxygen or hydrocarbons or um, the, you know, the turbidity of the water um, through um, these attenuation meters. There's a lot, again, lots of different payloads that you can put on these vehicles um, and acoustic sensors as well. So because they're so quiet, they're fantastic for that. And I'll show a quick example of that here in just a minute. Um, one of the new things uh, people were asking about what's new on the glider, we're just introducing this wet payload bay. So this is a new section front end of the glider, which allows you to put flooded uh, payloads in. Uh, so this makes integration a lot easier instead of having to put electronics or into our, um, you know, our housing and then put the wires through the hall and do all that. This is actually a whole flooded section now. So if you have a standalone unit, it um, makes it really easy to integrate. Here's the RBR CTD. Uh, this is the um, Crescendo, I think it is, uh, that's integrated here and you know, just has a wet mate connector that goes to the bulkhead. So very simple to integrate some other sensor types now, um, which is great, especially in depth. Um, so lots of different applications, certainly ocean observation. Uh, there are some defense applications, as I mentioned before, and, and a number of commercial applications as well. Um, so the gliders kind of cover the gamut. A uh, couple that I want to just point out today that I think are really interesting. We're doing a lot now with acoustic monitoring, passive acoustic monitoring, and looking both for whales, uh, which has become obviously a, a hot topic um, for the shipping industry because of ship strikes. It also... Um, uh, for um, construction, offshore wind in particular, uh, offshore construction, that, that it's a requirement that they, you know, look for mammals um, out at the wind farms or laying cables. So uh, it's become a, again, hot topic there. And then there's also, you know, scientists who are simply just looking to look at um, animal counts and, um, you know, where they're, where they're located. So We've worked with a couple of different manufacturers now on different sensor packages. This is a, a DMON sensor. It's a Woods Hole developed uh, passive acoustic monitoring. It's just a hydrophone uh, that's it's listening for, for whales. And it's a broadband recorder, so picking up other things as well. Um, so the vehicle will record that data um, and it can find events and, and you know identify certain events, but it, it doesn't identify the whale species. It can't actually do that on board yet, but 
uh, once you get the data back on shore, um, you can go through those events and look at the specific items and then match those up to known characteristics. And then you can look at actual well types. So uh, these were some recent missions. This is up uh, you know, New Brunswick and actually the Prince Edward Island here in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Uh, ran a number of missions up in that area. Um, this is high shipping traffic lane. So shipping industry is really interested uh, to see if they can use these gliders to avoid um, areas where the whales are that can help keep them running. Uh, otherwise, they actually shut down these lanes or um, have to go super, super slow. And that causes them lots of um, pain from a dollar standpoint. So, you know, there's there's industry interest, there's scientific interest. And, um, you know, it's, it's a good, it's a great product that's coming out now um, that we're really happy to be part of. So interesting uh, application there. Uh, another interesting application, this is uh, looking at uh, fish counts here. This is a, a zooplankton fish profiler that's made by ASL. Uh, this is a program run out of NOAA. Um, I think actually this is the San Diego group uh, that's running these, but they're um, you know, looking for uh, krill and different fish counts here. This is, um, you know, uh, like it's a profile that they did down off the tip of South America. Uh, you can see down here the, the density, the krill density that uh, was measured from a tow and a trawl was very close to what we measured with the ACFP. So showing that the, the sensor actually works really well and um, reduces the cost of doing these surveys tremendously by having you know autonomous vehicle out there that can profile for days, if not months, uh, looking at those and keeping account of, um, of these species. So that's a, that's a great profiler and something we've worked on for, for a while with those guys. Another good use case for gliders here is the Ocean Observing Network or OOI or Ocean Observing um, of the um, um, initiative. Uh, here we're using gliders to get data off of subsea moorings and again some of these actually may be scripts moorings but uh, we work specifically here with Woods Hole um, and uh, Oregon State uh, we've got different observer. They they have different observatories out, um, you know, taking these water measurements. Uh, they're all subsea, and then the glider comes around and interrogates the nodes, uh, gets data off with the benthos modems, and transfers that data to the glider, which then transfers that data, um, you know, to through satellite back to back to land. So, a um, number of different observatories out there. We've got about 24 gliders in, the, in this OI coastal um, in the east and west coast. Open ocean, there's 24 gliders that were deployed um, back, you know, quite a ways back here, and then 16 more uh, that are just doing global profiling. Um, so we continually uh, upgrade and monitor this fleet. And, um, and that's, a, again, another great use for glider technology is sort of a data truck between subsea assets that are communicating through acoustics to uh, satellite. Another interesting use case here for gliders is the storm prediction monitoring. This has been much more of a hot topic lately, um, and certainly no pun intended, but it is measuring water temperature, you know, at the surface and then down to depth uh, in finding that there is certainly a correlation between storm intensity and um, water temperature at depth. Uh, so not exactly so easy. You can clearly measure the sea surface temperature and, and try to predict storm intensity that way. But as you know, we've gotten really good at finding out the direction of storms um, and can predict very well where landfall is going to be days in advance, but struggling with the intensity forecast, uh, as we've seen in several recent storms that have intensified really quickly near shore. Um, this data that we're gathering with gliders and in partnership with Rutgers and NOAA uh, and even the Navy have, have volunteered gliders for some of these studies uh, are finding that, you know, it is a, it's a I mean, or the intensity is again heavily dependent on the temperature all the way down. So, um, as the storm passes over, what you're seeing here on this plot is, um, you know, prior. This is a time sequence at depth, um, and you can see here that the water there's a there's a real thick um, uh, boundary layer here between the hot and the cold water prior to the storm passing. When the storm passes over that area, you can see the mixing that occurs. A lot of that um, hot water that, that this depth's getting pulled up, but if there's a big cold sink at the bottom, then you know the storm ends up you know not having nearly as much intensity as it would have um, if there was hot water here. So again, by doing these profiles, you can really get an idea of a much better prediction of what the intensity of the storms is going to be. Um, if you look back in 2020 and 2021. Uh, NOAA had about 47 gliders out, um, or glider deployments, I should say, out um, looking at those measurements. They did almost 180,000 profiles 
Uh, last year, they did um, 66 deployments. They had about 78,000 profiles. So mixing this together with the, the, the airplanes and satellite data, again, it's really helping with intensity forecasting. So um, one other glider uh, uh, use case here, which just was presented this week. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Liza Wright Fairbanks for her slides here, but uh, Dr. Fairbanks was the uh, Walter Monk Scholar Award recipient at Rutgers for her work using um, gliders for measuring pH. Uh, so she, she put a, a pH sensor built by Seabird onto a glider. They called her the Foxy Lady, the pH OXY. Um, sent it out and um, also with the Optode and an EcoPuck in a, in a CTD that was with the, the pH sensor and gathered data in the Gulf Stream. So here they were going out of, um, uh, out of Atlantic City up in New Jersey and then transitioning out to the, the edge of the uh, shelf, continental shelf and back uh, and looking at the pH measurements through that area. Of course, also getting temperature, salinity, chlorophyll, oxygen at the same time. But with that transect, you can really see a whole time sequence here. Um, you're also seeing depth here as they're going out towards the shelf. You can see it really drops off here as they get to the edge and then they came back. Uh, but you can look at the pH measurements over here, um, showing that this is a viable sensor uh, now for combining all these different measurements together. So um, really interesting work there. This was actually back in 2018 when they were uh, just kind of doing their first missions. Uh, but subsequent to that, they've done a number of other um, profiles of missions and they're looking at seasonality as well. So now we're starting to actually see there is definitely seasonality in the pH measurements um, as well, uh, attributed to the mixing of the Gulf Stream with the coastal waters. So really interesting analysis. Uh, so she just presented that this week. Again, thank her for those slides. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on floats. Uh, I know um, Scripps has a really long history here with profiling floats, but I uh, just wanted to mention that, you know, we do manufacture a number of different types of floats. Uh, our standard Argo floats, our biogeochemical floats, we now can host up to six different biogeochemical sensors on a single platform. Our electromagnetic float, which is a really interesting uh, way of doing microcurrent analysis. And so that's, uh, that's a, becoming more and more of interest um, to uh, both scientific purposes, but also US Navy. Um, other multi-sensor floats, and then our deep apex float, um, which, uh, which goes down again, 6,000 meters. I'm sure you're all pretty familiar with the Argo mission, the Argo community, but um, almost 2 million profiles collected now, a 20 year old observing mission all over the world, you know, three to 4,000 floats deployed at any one time, really giving us the most up to date current, current modeling as well as climate forecasting information. So most of our really good climate forecasting information is coming from the Argo program and these floats. And now with the biogeochemical floats being introduced, it's giving us even more data about um, all the other parameters of the ocean as well. So a great program that we've been really happy to be part of for a long, long time. Um, I mentioned the BGC floats here. So, you know, pH, oxygen, nitrate, there's a lot of different, uh, different measurements we take there. Uh, another platform we have here is our surface boat. So this is a uh, what we call our Z boat 1800. It's a 1 1.8 meter surface vessel. It's really great for inland waterways, rivers, uh, harbors, lakes, uh, trailing, tailing ponds. Uh, not so great for ocean open or open ocean. Excuse me. That's not really the main purpose here. But for anything that's coastal, is um, you know its inlets and and seas, it's actually really good for that. Um, we uh, did a, a survey not long ago for the Navy out um, at the, in Pearl Harbor um, and did a, a survey of that area. We were the only boat that's ever been allowed to actually fly over the USS Missouri, which is um, underneath the memorial here, uh, but did a high resolution multi-beam imagery scan of that. Um, good for a number of different um, applications, but primarily it's mapping and survey data. It gives you good depth to the bottom as well as uh, you can get two, good two-dimensional mapping of, of, again, rivers and waterways and areas that um, are changing over time. So it's good for infrastructure inspection, dams, um, you know, that kind of thing. Also some interesting science missions here. They took the boat out uh, and this was a NASA JPL mission where they were looking um, at sea surface ice uh, looking at the depth of that and also looking at rivers and waterways through the ice and how that was changing over time. Uh, so that was a really interesting application. Here at the University of Washington um, Civil and Environmental Engineering Group, um, they got some NSF funding to go off and provide these boats to um, different 
uh, places around the world that were looking for um, post storm or post disaster measurements of um, cities, waterways. Again, it was a way for them to get um, an idea of the change after disasters. So uh, again, interesting use case uh, of a Z boat. Um, switching over to our acoustics, just quickly touching here on Benthos and some of the products that we have there, acoustic releases, which I know Scripps has a number of, uh, acoustic modems, um, again, over in Uwe's lab, a um, number of modems that we use there. Um, and then we also have a line of positioning for small, uh, small vessels, ROVs and AUVs in particular, but you could track uh, anything subsea with the system, with our track it system. A um, couple of use cases here for acoustics. Uh, I, most people probably don't know this, but you know, with our tsunami warning detection system that's around the United States and other countries, they um, are constantly measuring for seismic or uh, pressure waves, I'm sorry, from tsunamis, and uh, that uses acoustic systems to telemeter that data from the pressures, pressure sensors at the bottom here um, up to the buoys that then communicate that to the satellite. So this is all part of our 24-7 um, you know, real-time tsunami warning system that NOAA um, has out there, and it's using um, Benthos acoustics for that. Uh, but you can imagine the same concept works for any subsea platform. Uh, similar to the way the gliders work for OI, you can you know, acoustically telemeter data uh, to a surface buoy or a boat, and then um, obviously get that to shore. Another new use case, which um, is just coming sort of out, is this idea of using acoustics for ropeless fishing. So this is specifically true for lobster and crab traps. Here we're working with a company called Smelts, who has developed a lift bag technology on their lobster pot. So the concept here is to remove the surface lines from the trap to the surface for whale entanglements. And it's especially prevalent in the Northeast with the right whales, which are um, down to less than 400 species now, or 400 individuals in, in the world, um, extremely endangered. And so a lot of the issues that they have with the uh, whale um, deaths is really due to entanglement with lobster lines and crab lines. So. We're working with these guys to create a new ropeless fishing uh, system. It's actually going really well. They're doing trials right now, and uh, NOAA is really starting to look at this as a in the National Marine Fisheries Service as a real alternative technology to roped uh, fishing. But the concept is is you've got an acoustic modem um, down in the trap, and when you trigger it from the system using a deck box or from the surface, it inflates the lift bag. Uh, there's a small cartridge of um, CO2 at the bottom that inflates the bag. Uh, that pops the trap up to the surface and then they haul it in like they normally would um, and uh, can pull up the rest of the trap. So this is a really exciting uh, technology that we're, we're working on and happy to be certainly part of that as well. Um, another interesting application here using both RDI technology as well as Benthos is um, looking at ice buildup in the Barrow Strait here up in um, Canada. Uh, so here there's, uh, we're using acoustic monitoring. There's a data hub at the bottom plus a couple subsea moorings. Uh, so they're using an ADCP to measure current through the strait. Uh, also using this microcat CTD um, and then an upward looking ice profiling sonar to look at the, the ice drift. Um, the whole purpose of this mission is really to see when does this strait freeze over and to be able to predict that for shipping. Um, and so with this, this is again a real-time system that's constantly measuring that. They were able to uh, use all that acoustic data um, to figure that out. So that was um, a project run by, um, by a group up in Canada uh, for that. Um, low frequency sound sources is another product that we have. And again, I know Scripps is uh, involved in this as well. Uh, we've got a, a few units out that way that um, we continually work with um, in terms of updating and, um, and upgrading. Uh, but these low frequency sources are really low, like sub sub 200 hertz or 200 hertz-ish, um, certainly sub 1,000 hertz, but can transmit sound over really long distances, um, really almost full, full ocean basin and even um, some around the world at really, really low frequency. Um, but this is part of uh, tomography experiments of doing some you know, subsea water mapping. Um, and a more recent uh, device that we're building is what we call a bubble source. This is a, a really low frequency source. So this will go all the way down to sub one Hertz, but it's somewhere you know, between um, zero to hundred Hertz, uh, specifically one, one and a half Hertz up to hundred Hertz. It's a swept source. 
uh, and it's actually fully programmable. So um, even though it is monotonic, you can do all sorts of interesting patterns with it. Um, but it, the way it works is it's um, there's a resonator inside that's um, vibrating a bubble. So this is just a rubber membrane essentially. Um, and there's air in between there. And so um, by doing that, you couple the, the bubble couples to the water um, and is pressing against the water, the bigger the bubble. You can see actually we have the back of a truck here, a really big bubble source uh, that we built for seismic industry to try to get rid of air guns. Uh, but you can say you can couple a lot of water, a lot of energy to the water um, through this membrane. And, um, and it's a very efficient source because you're not directly pushing on the water, you're pushing on the, the air inside the unit that's pushing the membrane. So um, this is a really interesting technology that um, we're just releasing now. So if anyone's interested in that, certainly let me know. <clears throat> the last thing I'm just going to touch on here for the last two minutes, and then uh, certainly ready to take questions. If there are any, I uh, just want to touch on our sort of social responsibility right now and sustainability. Um, Teledyne has a mandate to try to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 40% by 2040. Uh, we've got a number of things working now in that area to try to accomplish that. Um, we have a number of different programs that are also helping in terms of just measuring um, the impact that we all have on this world. So uh, satellite in particular, we have a lot of different sensors that um, we're providing to, to NASA and NOAA and other agencies for doing monitoring from space. Um, that are looking at uh, carbon dioxide and nitrogen sul uh, dioxide, sulfur dioxide, lots of different chemical measurements um, and the impact that, that uh, we're seeing there. Uh, we have a wide range of other products that are environmental in nature. Uh, this gets back to that environmental test group. So pollution monitoring, water quality monitoring, a uh, number of different products that we have there. And then of course we have our, our subsea units, which we were just talking about, like the glider and the floats, which are measuring oceanographic changes uh, and climate change, uh, and also helping to reduce ships on the water. So um, the idea of using autonomous systems like AUVs is really to help um, get the, the ships back in port and let these vehicles go off and do these missions without the huge carbon footprint um, and the big expense of a ocean going vessel. So uh, other areas we're, we're working on. Um, Last thing I'll say here, if you're interested in any additional information about any of our products or services or anything else we're doing sort of at the Teledyne level, um, we've got a number of different online uh, areas here on our website that might be of interest. We've got our Marine Channel, which has a number of uh, pre-recorded talks that you can look at on products and services and customer talks as well for use cases, some of which I just highlighted. Um, so that's all out there. The, that's um, video channel. Then we have our webinar channel, which I was just mentioned. That's the Marine Link. And then finally, we have our podcast channel uh, where there's, uh, I think, almost 40 podcasts now out there, uh, which we call Marine Tech Talk, talking about a lot of our, again, technologies there too. So I just want to thank everybody for joining us today. Hopefully that was sort of in alignment with what you were interested in seeing, kind of a mix of uh, what's new for us and also some you know, use cases uh, about how, at least in the sort of more academic and science world, people are using our equipment. Um, I did have a lot of questions previously that were you know, sent in. I, hopefully I touched on most of those, but if there was anything I didn't hit, um, I'd be happy to take those questions now. Thank you, Dan. Thanks for the excellent presentation. Um, I think that was very comprehensive and we want to open it up to the group now to ask any questions that you might have. So feel free to enter your questions down in the Q&A, which you can find at the bottom center of your screen or in the chat, or feel free to unmute yourself and ask away. I know there were some pre-submitted questions I can start with too. Yeah, that'd be fine if you want to do that. Yeah, there were some, yeah, go ahead. Oh, there were some questions around ROVs and using them for like inspecting moorings. Um, I don't know if you can speak to that. Yeah, I didn't put anything in here specific to ROVs. Um, certainly we have some good good use case data for those um, as well, the Seabotics ROVs we sell, but yeah, they're a really good tool for that. Um, we are right now redesigning our vehicle, which is Actually, the main reason I didn't put it in there is because we're um, actually getting a whole new electronic set for it um, that's going to be done at the middle of the summer. So we're going to start sort of pushing the new system out in the fall um, for sales. 
Um, and with that, we hope to have you know some expanded capability there. But the ROV is really good size. It's if you've seen it before, but it's you know single person portable type system. Um, but is really good for mooring inspections. Uh, you can have you know sonar systems, a two dimensional blue view sonars as well as cameras, and, and um, for doing visual inspections. And we have autonomous software also that can do orbiting, so you can do surveys and circles and lots of things. But yeah, really good for that. We also sell them um, to aquaculture farms for looking at nets and you know fish nets, that kind of thing. So yeah, good product for that. Excellent, thank you. Anybody have any questions from the audience? I hear Sue so got a comment. Um, thanking for the presentation. There was another question that was submitted before that I don't think you touched upon asking about what kind of career opportunities are there in the sector? Great. That's even, it's a really good partner question because um, we have a lot of job openings right now. So anyone who um, is a student there is it looking for, for work, um, there's a lot of really interesting job opportunities um, just in general, um, but, you know, as far as the technology group here, the vehicle team, um, you know, we're, we, we engineer everything here at the, at the building, so we're always looking for really high quality, good engineers. Um, if you have any ocean experience, that's even better. Um, but, you know, we have obviously business, we have marketing, we have sales, um, we have production, we have operations. So we build all of our equipment here um, at Teledyne and we design all of our all of our own equipment. Um, we do send some things out to be manufactured like circuit boards, but really it's a really wide breadth of um, engineering and manufacturing skills that we look for. Uh, we do have some scientists on staff, um, not as prevalent. Um, some areas more than others, at least in the marine space, we don't have a, a whole lot, but um, acousticians, for instance, we just talked about acoustics is an interesting area that um, you know, we typically have people on our staff that, that do those sort of things. Um, and then uh, other parts of the business, as I mentioned, there's the PhD group up in, in the Los Angeles area. Um, you know, so there's a lot, a lot of need for material scientists and, and um, you know, PhDs and that sort of thing there too. So, so pretty wide variety. We have, if anyone's interested in jobs in particular, uh, teledynetechnologies.com, that's where you'll find the job listings. Uh, and we do have internship programs as well. Uh, actually, I think right now we've, um, I don't know if we've fully closed ours yet, but um, if you're interested in that, just send an email to me through Vanessa and um, we can look at that as well. Excellent, thank you, Dan. Um, I have another question here, I'm not sure you touched upon too, asking about what kind of battery chemistries are used in your equipment. So we use a combination of two batteries, primarily alkalines and then lithium ions. So we have both primary lithiums um, and then we have rechargeables. Um, so we, again, use sort of a combination of those things. There's re different reasons for different battery chemistries. The alkaline batteries are safer, of course, because lithium and water don't play well together. So um, it's a requirement in some places that it must be alkaline. Uh, but you don't get as much energy, of course, because the energy density isn't as, as good as it is with lithium, lithium ions. Um, but again, due to restrictions, some people can't do that. Um, for some items like floats, it uh, doesn't make sense to have rechargeables because the floats are deployed and then they're not recovered. Uh, but the lithium um, rechargeables are great for the Gavia and for the Slocum gliders where, um, you know, you obviously do intend to you know, get the vehicles back and, and recharge them. So it's a great way to save money and um, and and money and environment as well. So those are our primary um, primary battery sources. But within Teledyne, we actually have a group called Teledyne Energy Systems that is developing fuel cell technologies for a number of different um, of platforms, including some of our subsea platforms. So um, that's something we've looked at. And they also build the, the thermal nuclear generators for the space business as well. So they do the RTGs for deep space missions. So a whole different thing. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, I have a few more questions that are already submitted, but I also want to open it up to the group. If anyone has a burning question, ask it now. <laughs> um, and yeah, feel free to unmute. Uh, one I think that was in here that was not addressed was asking about the role of signal processing and signal analysis algorithms and implementation. Yeah, um, I touched on that briefly in the acoustic piece, which I think is probably where that right now is coming in um, to play the most in terms of looking at, you know, 
acoustic signals and then try to make sense of, of the data that's in there in real time. Um, so you know, we're working with a few partners. JASCO up in uh, Canada builds um, an acoustic sensor package that does real time signal processing um, and um, again, event detection um, and, and can do some amount of identification, but really the the majority again of the the identification piece is, is has to be still done online or offline excuse me um and i know they have some algorithms for doing that too so it's that's sort of more on you know sort of i guess the, again the hydrophone acoustics and that sort of thing within our vehicles we do a lot of a lot of signal processing especially on the acoustic side for the modems um and um, different waveforms that we can program in uh, so on the both transmit and receive, but on the transmit side. So we have a different number of different protocols that we use um, for transmitting data. Um, and then those can be programmed as well. Um, but we, um, but yeah, so we do a lot, we do a lot of signal processing, I guess, on board on our systems um, in the acoustics area in particular. So I don't know if that was probably not a great answer to the question, but I think that's great. And I think Jim had just popped a question asking about the new ROVs and will they have manipulator arm capabilities? You can stick to that. Yeah. Yeah. So we actually already partnered with um, Blueprint Robotics. I don't know if you know those guys down in Australia, but we were we've integrated their arm onto our system. Um, I think that is a it's at least a three degree of freedom, if not five degree of freedom manipulator. Right now, the standard ROV has always come with a grabber. It's just a single, you know, single sort of manipulate or uh, degree of freedom manipulator. But um, yeah, we have done more complex integrations, although what we're working on now is trying to integrate that directly into the control software. The way it works now is you have a separate sort of unit and a joystick for that that operates independent of the ROV. So we're now working on trying to combine those together so that you can have good control at the same time that you can um, run the manipulator, yeah. Great, thank you so much, Dan. I don't really see any other questions coming in. So um, okay. I think you must have covered everything in your conference. Exactly. So Killed well it. done. <laughs> and thank you so much for with info, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for your presentation today. I know sure. uh, there was a lot of interest and we appreciate your time and we appreciate uh, everybody that's logged on today. Um, yeah. Just for reference too, we have a couple more uh, technical forum presentations coming up in April. Next week, we'll have subsea imaging on April 7th. And on April 20th, we'll be hearing from Kongsberg. So um, keep uh, checking the technical forum website for more details and registration links. And again, thank you everybody today. Uh, yep, looks like you answered everyone's questions. So thank you awesome. all for your yeah. participation. If anybody, if anybody has further questions, yes, yeah, certainly again, let me know. We'd be happy to talk to you. And we're out there. Um, actually, I think we have an open house coming up on the 13th, right, at Teledyne and RDI. So that's another place you can get in touch with us. But anyway, just, yeah, reach out to us. We'd be happy to get you additional information. Thanks for the opportunity. It's great. Excellent. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, everyone. Hope you all have a great weekend. Yes.